Here we go. So, um, yeah, the presentation's topic is going to be, uh, unsurprisingly, Homer and Homer 7, as, uh, you know, for almost every summit. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. For those uh, of you who don't know me, I'm one of the co-founders of the project, and I run the company behind uh, Homer uh, with my uh, fellows who are around the room. Uh, QXIP is the name of our group, company, uh, and BB. We're based here in Amsterdam. And we basically spend our time uh, working on Homer, HEP, uh, HEPIC, and a bunch of the uh, pieces that make our monitoring solutions. Uh, we're all about capturing packets, dissecting, and doing something out of them. That's interesting. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a generic misconception that we only do Homer. Uh, we don't. Uh, we run a bunch of other projects uh, into uh, deep packet inspection and uh, general network monitoring uh, uh, and a bunch of other things. But Homer is what we're known for and what we're talking about today. So um, a few points here, and I might change them because I, uh, you know, it's a different time and uh, also influenced by other you know, points and presentations. This was the original list, but actually uh, we'll skip some of these things. Uh, the main point is for those who don't know what uh, is Homer, what it's useful for, uh, debunking a few myths about it being only useful for uh, VoIP, while well, it's just very well geared for it. What well, you can use it for, a couple of use case scenarios, and uh, how we treat data inside. This was the original plan, but I've changed it. So um, we're actually going to be talking about what uh, Homer is capable of in general. So uh, we already did, uh, how many of you already are using Homer? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a good percentage. For everybody else, uh, Homer is, uh, again, this is a fresh opportunity. It's a generic collector for uh, uh, real-time communication events, packets, and whatnot. So it's a generic uh, storage endpoint where you can uh, mirror all or some of the data that you're interested into from a bunch of platforms. Uh, it's mostly based around the HEP encapsulation protocol. Sorry about the new lines, I shrinked it too much. Uh, HEP encapsulation protocol, which is the uh, transports that we use to uh, retain the data that we mirror. Inside HEP, you can have an original datagram, you can have an event, you can have a JSON object, you can have a CDR. It doesn't really matter. It's just a generic way to move things around. We have uh, libraries, we have <coughs> native integrations, and we have middleware to interface with a bunch of things that we're interested in. So, the Homer part is quite generic, even if it's uh, natively supported by OpenSIPs and a bunch of other platforms. Uh, that's just the peak of the iceberg. The point is take all of the data that we can get natively uh, and uh, intersect it with data that we do not have natively. So it could be sitting in another database, it could be sitting uh, on the wire, it could be just a snippet of something. So the point of Homer is really uh, capturing a bunch of different things and stitching them together nowadays. It's not like a you know a off the shelf uh, application where you just click and search zip and that's it, but it's more of a complex uh, uh, bundle of modules that anyone, of course, first ourselves, but it, this is designed for anyone to be able to build <coughs> a capture solution, be it just a headless one. So somebody just wants to you know capture some packets, throw them in a database, and give them a purpose in their you know design or architecture all the way to having you know, a full interface where you can search for calls. So nowadays it can be a completely headless concept. Uh, seven is a full rewrite of uh, what uh, most people know as Homer, which is version five. Again, SIP-centric, it didn't do a bunch of things. Today it's, a, it's a quite a different project. Um, again, it's designed to support any protocol. We don't care what people are storing in Homer nowadays. We consider everything something related to a real-time event, uh, something that contains uh, something of interest for somebody's purpose. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be as simple as, uh, I don't know, taking an average call duration or uh, counting how many invites you have, all the way to tracking uh, detailed quality metrics from media streams or uh, tapping something from a web browser or RTC session. It's very generic. Uh, I'll show you how this works specifically today. It's integration ready, so it's designed to be either a standalone platform or a completely headless platform that you can use only 10% uh, for a specific purpose you have. So it doesn't come as a, you know, uh, a monolithic piece, but uh, many of the things that we use to make Homer can be recycled by any other developer to you know, uh, reproduce part of the functionality or even make another Homer from scratch really nowadays. 
uh, it's standalone, so we come from uh, a dependency legacy where Homer was really uh, a subset of uh, OpenSips or Kamaido in terms of the core feature of capturing. This has been uh, no longer the case for uh, almost two years now, even if it's been on a slow adoption. Nowadays, we have standalone uh, server and client uh, components. Uh, most of them are in Go, meaning that it's as simple as downloading a binary, giving it permissions to run a uh, few config parameters, and you have a platform up and running. So there's no longer a complex process of installing many pieces and many elements, configuring them. It's so simple, people are actually think that you know they skipped some steps nowadays when they see it and they go look for additional documentation. It's a one-liner really to run uh, one of our setups nowadays. And again, and I want to stress this out for all of you that are developing or working on a project or uh, making a new application, all of the building blocks that we have are designed for you before the user. So many of those pieces are made to be integrated into your uh, web app, into your server component, to your gateway, whatever you want to be able to do monitoring and mirroring from day zero. So instead of you know creating something and then realizing after a bunch of time, oh shoot, how do I measure this? Or you know what are the key KPIs of my applications? This should be done at the beginning by design. And we do have a bunch of those components available. Most people don't use them. They think about this much, much later. So this is just a, you know, a snapshot in terms of what Homer 7 wants to be and is from a you know, technical standpoint. Uh, what do people use it for? Uh, this is just a few of the uh, very you know, uh, top uh, use cases that we have. So the classic one, capturing packets. I have a bunch of traffic. I just want to be able to search for it by you know, normal headers. And uh, that's kind of the entry point. Uh, the RTC analytics is something that we spent the last uh, couple of years uh, working on. Uh, it started with uh, Lorenzo and Janus, and nowadays it made it all the way to uh, Jitsi with the help of uh, Saul. So we're monitoring server-side RTC components, browser-side RTC components. This is a bunch of stuff that most people don't kind of uh, <coughs> identify Homer with. Uh, but it is. So uh, again, it's a generic collector. We have uh, uh, pieces and libraries where uh, you, know, you just throw or load a library in your browser. You can ship. Uh, custom events to our collector directly, indirectly through the existing uh, you know, uh, transports you have and uh, make things easy once they go bad. So troubleshooting, a bunch of it. Alerts, everything that we create. I mean, I would say 99% of people use it or want to use it for uh, being reactive. So they want you know, the application to do their job while they're you know, working on the next design they just want to have a reliable method of being alerted when something weird is happening, uh, which takes us to the bottom, to big data producer and uh, machine learning uh, feed, if you will. So all of those numbers, of course, you can use them once to see what happened to that customer, but they make a lot more sense when you take them as a large chunk. So you're going to have six months worth of your statistics. You can use that to do a bunch of things uh, other than just you know making a couple alerts and throwing them away that data becomes more and more valuable as you collect it to train you know, a, a machine learning model, uh, to forecast your growth, to understand what you did wrong about the design as you improve an application. There's a bunch of uh, you know, usages that people don't really identify. They more think of it as a post-mortem investigation platform where, oh, I had an issue. Let me go in the time machine and see what happened. But you know, this also has a forward uh, kind of uh, approach if people use it. So uh, this is a map, and I hope you can read it from there, of what Homer 7 is today. So on the left side, you see some, not all, of the uh, data feeds that we natively support. So if you're using anything on that list, uh, turning on monitoring is most likely the matter of a couple of lines of config or making a couple of decisions and opening a couple of firewall ports. So all of those elements can directly stream into our platform, either using HEP, which is our encapsulation protocol. You can find more about this on our GitHub. Uh, as a, you know, uh, it's probably one of the few things that we documented well. Uh, so either HEP native or JSON events. JSON is for the new school uh, type of agent. So you know something that comes from uh, uh, an extraction of a log or an event in a browser. You know, a little dynamic something that you can just send into the platform. Uh, once it's inside, the magic happens. Uh, the magic is mostly correlation, and I'm going to show you what this means. 
once we correlate events and we know how they uh, relate to each other, uh, uh, data can take three routes. It either becomes data, so something that we just take, store into the database for later search, so something that gets indexed and uh, remains available for troubleshooting, or it gets synthesized into time series. This is the case of, uh, let's say, the uh, WebRTC media statistics. You're gonna get hundreds of thousands of reports about a chunk of your media communication. Do we care about keeping them all? Hell no. Those are gonna, you know, uh, old hostage uh, tons of gigabytes of your traffic to tell you absolutely nothing. So what Homer does here, it's, uh, it allows the integrator to synthesize this data into just a couple of numbers, time series. We shrink them down, uh, you know, 100 times fold, and now magically you can keep them for months and years, and again, use them to feed machine learning or whatnot, you know, your, your own team. Uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, eat your own dog food. Last but not least, logs. So a bunch of things fall into the uh, this is nothing category. We just want to keep them for correlation, for uh, let's say advanced troubleshooting. So this is the case of you know having a system that's producing packets. He has a client that's producing statistics or data, and he has subsystems or applications that produce logs. We can have all of these converge into just one place, basically. So let's get to the interesting part. This is just uh, you know if I can get away with uh, people understanding this today, I'd be already uh, super satisfied. So we keep saying it's agnostic protocols, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, it, it sounds good, but how does it really work? Uh, this is an example uh, that we do have you know, in uh, reality today. Uh, for everybody's uh, ease, we start from a SIP session. So we have a system, a proxy, back-to-back -back user agent, whatever you want, who's handling a SIP session. This SIP session it gets captured and it ends up in the Homer database. So far, all good and normal. So if we uh, select this session, we can see our messages and uh, everything's fine and fine. But of course, uh, this gets interesting when we start hopping around. So uh, this SIP session is gonna have stuff that's related it, to it. Of course, uh, RTP or RTCP statistics are gonna be sitting in a database. How do we make it to those? Homer can uh, provide a mapping method to go and parse whatever your SDPs or whatever you trust out of the signaling, take a vector, and go look for all of the relevant statistics. You might have complex cases where in the signaling you don't even know actually what the media endpoint could be because you have uh, invisible netting or uh, you know something that only takes place between the agents and it's assumed by the system. There's a bunch of those scenarios that now can be easily programmed. So from SIP we can opt definitely into stats. Uh, maybe on the other side we have a, a, a browser as a client going through a, a web socket that's producing events. We can take something from our signaling, could be the username, maybe we, we copy uh, the call ID, maybe we leak a special identifier that links the two and hop to those RTC statistics. Those RTC statistics themselves could be linked to something else. So what I hope you see here is a cascading method where each uh, hop can find some other information, that other information can go look for uh, further legs. So we, you can fork this as many times as you want. It's uh, asynchronous, so this operation can uh, take uh, you know seconds to complete and it doesn't matter the information is merged back into the view so we're talking about you know an API or UI experience when you make a search this search hops around all of the possibilities that you have and it returns one large object that defines all of it uh, if you do it in our UI it just means that you see a call flow that goes from a SIP uh, message into a log into uh, an RTCP set of statistics into a custom CDR that gets generated at the end um, how can we get this data? We'll get to it. Some of it is going to be sitting in our database, so uh, many of these things actually end up in our database if you want. So events from browsers, from servers, statistics, logs, we can collect all of that natively. Uh, again, a little snapshot in terms of what uh, is compatible with those columns in terms of systems or uh, utilities that we have. You will see all of them now have the um, custom tag as well meaning that all of those stages have uh, pieces in our uh, GitHub repository to make them your own. So if it's not on the list, it means that there's a piece of code in any language on our repository that you can just literally copy paste, adjust, and uh, implement. So uh, I'd be curious actually to know if anybody uh, later finds something that's not included here or something that we should be covering. Uh, the RTC statistic is the one that's uh, growing the most recently, so we're trying to you know expand on the ability of doing uh, magic there. 
but the log ones is just as uh, important because from any log feed we can actually uh, extract and reproduce almost anything. We have some cases where from uh, just uh, logs we uh, resynthesize the signaling that we don't have visibility for. So it can get really complex and really creative in terms of you know stitching things together. Uh, Proto X means uh, a new protocol. So you know many of you are going to be developers. Maybe you're coming up with your own uh, you know flavor of signaling or maybe uh, you're working on uh, another type of protocol that you want to track and that's related to RTC to any extent. Um, I, we think that you know, it shouldn't take more than maybe a couple of days for somebody from scratch by copying the examples and the existing integration to uh, throw something completely new uh, into the current Homer. Um, within Homer, uh, we do have uh, mapping settings. This is where we define what's what. And it's just going to be JSON object definition. So this is post agents. Something is going to sniff the packet. Something is going to do the dissection. This is outside of the core. It's done by the agents or the platforms that are generating that packet. Once it makes it inside, this is as simple as I could do it. I'm going to try to explain it. On the left, we have um, a correlation mapping for the SIP protocol, or basically telling the platform, take uh, the uh, call ID from the data header of this protocol as a source field and uh, perform a lookup ID against type 100. For those of you that work already with Homer, type 100 is uh, logs. So uh, type 1 is SIP, type 100 is logs, so two different streams of data that have nothing to do with each other. I'm taking the call ID from SIP. I'm going to do a lookup in uh, the type 100, which is uh, logs. Again, this could be anything else. And I'm going to explain how I want to perform it. So the lookup field on the second protocol, protocol is going to be called SID. So we go from a call ID to an SID. And I'm going to extend the range uh, to make sure that this covers more than the original session. So let's say that my SIP session starts at 12 and it goes on for five minutes. I might have logs from before my actual session from the systems that you know, were preparing uh, or opening parts before I was starting to use them all the way until a little bit later when everything gets, uh, you know, the tear down complete. So you can control how you translate from information between protocols, uh, what the lookup field will be, and if you want to extend the range. On the right side, you see the target. So a field mapping for logs will contain an ID, SID, which is a string. It's indexed uh, in a certain way as a name. This could be anything you want. Does that make sense? Raise of hand, anybody has uh, something that's covered by this type of approach? I'm just curious. What, what are the units in the lookup range? What are the units in the UK? Per, uh, oh, those are uh, seconds. Um, I hope it makes sense, because this is really important. If you get this, then you already have you know, a use case for uh, uh, the new Homer or what it's made for. Of course, if you're just using for SIP, this is already done. You don't need to go in and punch it yourself. It, this is more dedicated to, you know, the edge cases or the cases where somebody is trying to stitch together two protocols that were not meant to be monitored as one. Um, so again, this is for data that we have in our own database. We capture this packet, we index it, it's in our database, we just look it up in a fancy way. What if we don't have the data? So there's going to be cases where you have the signaling in Homer and then you have CDRs somewhere else, statistics somewhere else. Maybe you have uh, another system that's capturing packets in a different place, in a different way, and you want to connect them together. Uh, this is uh, uh, the purpose of the PubSub lookup feature, which is brand new. It's only in Homer 7. This is a method where we can have uh, passive access to uh, already existing data anywhere else. So rather than create 100,000 connectors to 100,000 databases, we created a PubSub system that people can easily uh, put on top of another application as an API. So an example that I have on the uh, repository from today is uh, quite fun. It's an integration with VoIP Monitor that people perhaps wouldn't expect. So VoIP Monitor actually comes with a sniffer that does RTP recording and uh, audio conversion. Well, from uh, today on, you can actually use that data from the Homer UI. So we just made a an example pops up agent. It sits on top of VoIP Monitor open source sniffer, not the paid version, of course. We do open source. And it just offers through its API everything that VoIP Monitor has uh, achieved in its database by lookups and uh, file fetching directly into Homer. So this means that one can look up a session in Homer, 
Homer can ask a void monitor instance if he knows anything about this session too. And if he does, he just borrows all of its data. So a CDR, uh, an RTP file, an audio file, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do the same with something like uh, CG rates. So let's say that you're opening a session and you want to ask CG rates to, uh, you know, uh, project a rate or tell you a status for something. Now it's as simple as just mapping the two APIs in a small client and off you go. The way it's done, it's very similar. Right now we have uh, a few, uh, we have also integration with Loki that works the same way. And this is how we're gonna develop all of the upcoming integrations in, in Omer. It's gonna be small agents, uh, just as small as the capture ones that we have. So same logic, something that's portable, something that doesn't require you know, a lot of resources. It just sits on top of the original, so it doesn't require any changes. We remain you know, a little bit passive, just like we were with the uh, raw capture. And we just allow this stitching to happen. This is an example of one of those lookups. So uh, captured a session in Homer just with Amplify. This is just a super normal uh, you know, use case. But when I select this session, uh, I have one of those agents in pop up mode. So this system performs a lookup against VoIP monitor and it returns the CDR that the other system has generated. Place anything on the B side. So uh, if you have a case where you, know, you don't want to duplicate everything, you just want to make an interactive uh, type of uh, integration, I think it would take probably a half hour to do it from scratch on top of anything else. This could be a MySQL database, could be a pops up that returns something. Uh, you name it and chain it. And of course, if you come up with ideas, that's what we love. So I, you know, if any of you uh, has a vision for this or you know has an idea for this, please open an issue, open a proposal, come talk to me. We're looking for use cases for this. In the back. The query takes place, so Homer uh, is going to contact any agent. You can have one, you can have hundreds in pub sub mode. Uh, the system is going to broadcast to all of them uh, search ID, same way that we did before. So let's say we decide call ID is going to be my correlation vector. We're going to take this call ID, we're going to send it to all of those agents in uh, listen mode, and we're going to tell them that we're interested in a CDR. But this could be an RTP set, or it could be a log. You define it. Uh, the system takes those parameters, takes the time range, performs a lookup, and returns the data that you want. At that point, it's as simple as making an Angular template. If you want to display it in a fancy way, you want to make a chart, you want to make a table. It's, uh, you know, we want to leave this open this time. We don't want to decide for people how they should be working. We just want to give them a bunch of ways to uh, come up with something. And hopefully this is going to make Homer a little more of an interactive project rather than you know, an off the shelf something that people just expect to install and I don't know, do something for them. That's kind of a, a two-step process. User interface, uh, what's the time? Oh, 20, I'm good. No. Great. User interface, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it because uh, I want people to actually try it. So uh, nowadays, the easiest way to demo Homer is to pull one of our Docker containers, but we also have, a, uh, like the old days, uh, a bash installer that you can use on a vanilla system or VM. It's bad. Yes, it's back. It's back. Our guys uh, just finished it, and it should be on, already online now if they kept their word. If not, kicking in a couple asses is going to be uh, by the end of the day. But nevertheless, uh, the user interface is modular. Uh, we have a couple of types of widgets. One is for searching, so you make your own form. For each protocol, you automatically have a form type. So let's say that you go in Homer and you say, yeah, I create protocol ABC, and it's going to have uh, 10 fields. Once you define those, automatically you get a, a form for it that you can create, customize, and throw on your dashboards. The other ones are just for uh, time series and statistics. Uh, keep in mind with Omer 7 and this generation of the stack, everything can be done also outside. So if your company is already using uh, Grafana to do everything, then this system is just going to send data there and it doesn't require to go back to our UI. This is just for people that have nothing, they just want a new system, but for those that have complex ecosystems, integrations, they already use Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, Prometheus, you name it. This system doesn't require you to uh, double your effort. So we can just send all the data there, you merge it with yours, you do your correlation, your alerting at once. Uh, we have built-in methods to use all of it nevertheless. So uh, Prometheus queries, InfluxDB queries, and Loki queries are natively supported by Homer itself. So uh, you see an example here where you can uh, use the PromQL language to make a Loki query for logs. Those, again, are going to be sitting somewhere else. This is a different system. Homer is just talking to it 
and uh, fetching data into uh, your investigation. Uh, time range, I, I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this uh, because again, it's easier to try than explain. Uh, you can configure protocol, methods, statistics. I think this is pretty, you know, standard stuff. I mean, all of you, I'm sure, have used at least one of those, uh, you know, platforms that this is inspired by. So you're gonna find nothing really shocking there. We just try to stay with the, uh, uh, with the standard. Uh, what else can I say here? Um, investigation, so uh, again, this is how a typical search looks like. Uh, we return all columns. Uh, the user, the first time that uh, accesses the system, decides what's relevant to them. You can hide, conceal, rename. Once you make a setting, it remains like that for your session. So kind of, you know, the user preference is personal. Uh, two engineers can have two completely different views over the same data just by having their own uh, login session. Uh, the view and the correlation are uh, universal. So all of the protocols that we get now end up in the results. <coughs> There's no difference between a log, uh, an RTCP report, a SIP packet, a Janus event, a Jitsi event. They're all the same. We display them all together. We display them all in the same flow. So hopefully, you know, when you look at an end-to-end -end scenario, uh, you can literally follow it through time uh, in, a, in a clear way. How to get it up and running? Again, easiest if you are uh, fond of Docker or if one of your engineers is, this gets you up and running in five minutes. You just have to choose your platform uh, of uh, preference. If you like uh, Grafana, you go that way. If you like uh, InfluxDB, that's the middle one. If you love Elasticsearch, this is all done. Uh, for all of those systems, again, it can be headless. So the Omer UI is completely optional. You have it if you want it. If you don't care about it and you just want the raw data, if you just want to work with uh, you know time series, you can completely bypass it and just feed uh, the voice metrics, the KPIs, the CDRs, the events to your team that's in charge of that data. Um, it's a moving target, so again, we also have some new installers, but what's best is to uh, watch on uh, SIPCAPTURE.io, uh, to uh, watch Homer Project on uh, GitHub, or to send us an email and we'll help you. <coughs> uh, well, well, more or less, that's all for today. Um, it's more of a teaser, so, uh, you know, people already flow to Homer, people already installed it. We have thousands of setups if we put them together. Most of them are old, so they run the, uh, the Homer 5 generation. They don't want to move forward because it works fine, because it took a lot of time to set it up, and they're scared of change, but the change is worth it. So. Uh, unless you're running a SIP only platform with you know a very simple media uh, proxy situation and you don't have anything else, then I would highly suggest that you check out the new repository, that you get involved with the community, start asking questions, uh, or you know uh, joining the discussions, opening issues, throwing us ideas. Uh, it's time to move to seven. So if you haven't considered it already, it's time to do it because five is dead and we're not gonna support it ever again. It's over, it's dead, you gotta move on. So we hope to find you know, a bunch of new people joining Seven. We're ready to do the dirty work as we did before, so this is not the type of scenario where if you come and you don't find something, you're toast. All it takes is an issue. Typically, you know, we work around the clock and we're enthusiastic about what we do. So you know, we don't take it as a job, we take it as something we do with passion. So bring it on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lorenzo. Do you have any questions for Lorenzo out here? Okay. I know you raised your hand first, but he's close. So thank you for your presentation. I got a question about Dockerized version of mm -hmm. Homer. Uh, what base image do you use for your Docker? And uh, is it containing only the binaries or? We have. We have both. Uh, we have uh, containers which are uh, uh, full stack, so they also have the development part because we want to make it easy also to make changes to them. And then we have Alpine based containers that typically only have the binary version. Alpine? Uh, yes. Awesome. When, whenever we can, yes. We, we kind of like Alpine, it kind of does it for us. Uh, but typically it's for the deliver version. Then we also have uh, either Debian based or uh, also Alpine based development versions that's going to actually pull all of the source code is going to compile it, so you know to make it easy also to streamline the development process. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we are running Homer five. 
I've looked at all the stuff in the last few times. We can sit together. And it always says it's work in progress, it's bad now. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to have something stable. Yep. So do you suggest moving to home capital now? Is it, is it stable enough? Because let, I let me be clear. It's never going to be stable unless we get users. <laughs> <laughs> so you do it. You do that. We do the development. You make it stable by using it. That's really how it works. I mean, it's never going to be stable unless, you know, everybody starts moving to it. Yeah, okay, but it's, it's it is stable enough. I mean, we have it in production. It, the numbers that you can do with seven, I mean, are going to make you laugh about what you were able to do with five. It just takes a little bit of bravery to, you know, set up a twin system, mirror the packets, but it's worth it. We have it in production. People are using it. Mostly our customers are using it because <laughs> those that have it nowadays in production, they basically bought our consultancy to do it because, you know, it's an early stage and so on. But it works really, really good. We have serious and large operators that are, you know, relying on this. They're feeding them a ton of packets, and they bring us new challenges. And we just need more of it. So, you know, give us trouble. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? But uh, what? What? Uh, what is your? I don't know. Headline <laughs> for uh, uh, what it brings. Uh, those uh, new storages uh, on top of the SQL storage. So you have the SQL and you do the queries, etc. But then the time series, uh, the Grafana, yeah. uh, the influx DBs, etc. What what buys you? A good question. Uh, in our terms, it gives you the ability to scale the solution. Because I mean, going you know the SQL way only works for certain types of data and certain targets. But we found over the years that maybe 80% of our customers actually rely on the statistics that you get out of them to uh, be proactive. So it shrinks that part down so much that you know it makes it scalable. Also, those platforms are modern, you know, so they cluster uh, very easily. It's easy for you know, the end user to put together those systems. Mm -hmm. They're native in Docker, they're na native in Kubernetes, so they kind of have that you know, scalability as the, uh, the bottom line, and we just leverage it to the max. So we don't, you know, com uh, expect anyone to set up, you know, a distributed MySQL cluster anymore. Uh, we just, you know, tend to let them rely on their platform of choice, and we choose those that have scalability as a core uh, value, let's say, or a, a core feature. Okay. One more round of applause for Lorenzo. Thanks. Thanks.